And he came before our people, his face we knew not. Who is he, they asked. The he, with the magnificent lion's mane of gray, the voice echoes the rhythm of ages past. You have been blessed with the gift from the ancient, uh, the ancestors and, and, and the heavenly father with a, a beautiful voice. The voice which follows us across great and turbulent waters from the mighty continent of our homeland, Songhai, West Africa. Who is he whose eyes penetrate the chambers of our minds and unlocks the sweetness of our lamenting hearts? He is a teacher of the truth about African people. Who is this man? A man of wonder and of love. Someone, if you knew him, you loved him. This is the story of Dr. Edward Robinson, Jr., the story of a man whose life stands as a testament of extraordinary fortitude and indomitable will against enormous odds. Dr. Edward Robinson, Jr. has carried many titles. A noted historian. Uh, he's written books and pamphlets and, uh, to motivate young folk. He was one of my inspirations to go into business. Activist, scholar, educator, lecturer, lawyer, playwright, visionary, renaissance man, humble servant of the people. Dr. Robinson sang in the choir. Dr. Robinson, you found him, he's in church. It was about family. It was about family, too. But the title he treasured most was that of Historian of African and African American Studies, for which he is noted nationwide. He's not just a historian, he's a teacher. And that, that's a very different kind of connection to people. This is the story about the journey of one of the most enlightened men of our generation. The tapestry of world culture, which is a way that we can express how mankind has evolved. And this tapestry of world culture is made up of many different colored threads. But about 500 years ago, after thousands of years of the black threads being woven into this tapestry of world culture, the black threads were violently pulled out. And it's my mission in life 
to weave them back into the tapestry of world culture. In 1918, Philadelphia was a bustling melting pot of ethnic diversity, heavily populated with Italian, Irish, and Jewish immigrants. The Great Migration moved many African Americans to Philadelphia due to the many jobs spurred by America's involvement in World War I. Work was plentiful, but although Philadelphia was not part of the Jim Crow South, it was not exempt from racial injustice. This iconic era in this nation's history is where young Edward's formative development occurred. If you ever visited our home, the first place Ed would take you is down in the basement so you could see this wall and he would begin to tell you that he grew up in North Philadelphia and almost in an African-centered uh, street because the family, the grandmother, the father and everybody was there together. Born April 24, 1918 in North Philadelphia, Edward Robinson Jr. was reared in an historic cultural enclave. His parents were well-educated and hard-working people who knew the importance of cultural history. My mother and father always impacted upon us that we take care of each other. My father and my grandfather always gave him the feeling that he could do anything because my father made him feel that he could do anything. And then he would love to tell stories, so he'd have the neighborhood kids come out, sit on the steps, so he could tell them. So when you come to my house, you sit on the steps in the basement, and you listen to the stories of how he was brought up knowing who he was and that he was somebody special. From his earliest years, he was told of his maternal family's Nigerian background of wealth and splendor. Young Edward learned his great-great-great-grandfather, Mwale, was both a lawyer and a sculptor in Nigeria. His great-great-great-grandparents lived in a beautiful three-story home of polished stones. In 1813, Mwale was murdered by English soldier thieves who stole his sculptures and his gold. He was captured uh, because her husband fought the English coming and stealing his sculpture. And he was killed, and his pregnant wife put on board the ship with 247 others coming to America. Believe it or not, it was called Jesus. So she began to tell him at an early age the grandeur, sophistication of their homeland in Benin City, Nigeria. En route, a ship owned by good men, abolitionists, captured his grandmother's ship and towed it to Trenton. And this little girl, Diane, as she was growing up, her mother and Zynga, who is my great, great, great grandmother, told her the story of her sculpture father and her educated father and her lawyer father living in a beautiful home. So when Diane grew up, she had a child in 1842, whose name was Mary Diane Thomas, who helped raise me. These stories deeply imprinted upon his consciousness a profound African-centered worldview that would serve as a guiding force in his life. Educated in the Philadelphia school system, young Edward Robinson noticed that there was a lack of African history being taught in school. Oh, he'd love to tell you about his experiences at Dyer Elementary School. From there, he went to Central High. He was on the Barnwell Honor Roll at Central High, and he was... Uh, in charge the head of the newspaper there. Because he was built very well, as you know, they told him that he would be a mechanic or do some mechanical job because of his strength. Edward attended Virginia State University, where he earned his baccalaureate degree, graduating summa cum laude. One of the articles says that he was the most honored student there, straight A's all of the time. He then came back to his North Philadelphia home and achieved a Juris Doctorate degree from Temple University School of Law and practiced corporate law. While in college, he joined Alpha Phi Alpha, the first African-American fraternity established to create a bond of brotherhood between and among African descendants in America. Dr. Robinson began work at Provident Insurance Company and quickly rose through the ranks attaining the position of president, where he stayed for 35 years. He and my brother both were in the um, Providence Home Mutual Life Insurance Company, which started off with, I think, $250, and they rose to a multimillionaire. In 1968, 
While teaching an executive management class at Dillard University in New Orleans, Louisiana, he took his class on a trip to the French Quarter to see an auction block. He said he was standing. After the class went back to discussion, he said, Dr. Robinson, what was that halo around your head? What, what was that all about? And a vision appeared before me on the auction block. And the vision was of a crowd of people dressed in beautiful garb, velvet, and silks, and satins, finely wrought leather shoes. And a voice came from the crowd saying, Edward, tell them who we are. So that's been his mission. Tell people that we're not some jungle bunnies that have been Tarzanized, that we're from a mighty, mighty country. There's only one culture that existed uninterruptedly for thousands of years, and that was ancient Kemet, who gave reading and writing and all the attributes of civilization to the world. While the American educational system freely taught the history of other ethnic groups, Jewish, Irish, and British, there was no mention of ancient African history in the curriculum of learning. That particular history documents Africans as slaves and nothing more in American society. It's very sad that we have come to this point in time that we don't even know where we came from. Do you think any European will not know if he came from Ireland, which part of Ireland you came from? I don't think so. If people believe that you came from a land which had a great uh, sophistication and science, then your values goes high. But if you've been, if they've been brainwashed to believe you came from a jungle, then they believe that you're on the level of a jungle. So we have to establish the greatness of the land from which we came. We have to undo this, these 400 years of brainwash that they have put on us when the babies were snatched out of their mamas and daddies' arms. And our captivity, how many did they take us on those plantations and separate the mother from the father and kill the children? How many? 
We have a lot of Holocaust to talk about, a whole lot. Beginning in May of 1591, when the Europeans invaded our beautiful empire and marched our mothers and fathers to the seas to the waiting ships. And then, when they got there, to the shore, when they got to the so-called castles of Ghana and Gory Island in Senegal, they were herded into huge places, into rooms which could only accommodate a mere 50 people, and they crowded 300. And they had to stand in their own filth. And he said, never allow them to learn who they are. In fact, what you do, as soon as a boatload arrives, you take the babies out the mother's and daddy's arms and raise them away from the parents so they will never learn of the greatness of the Songhai people or of the Egyptian people. He told us that unlike any other ethnic group on the planet, every ethnic group has gone through hardships. And I don't mean to diminish what they've gone through, but there are no people on the planet that lost their land, lost their language, lost their culture, lost their religion, lost everything that made them what they are. And the effects of that that disaster, that great disaster, which is what the word Ma'afa means, uh, is still lingering in our society today. He talked about Africa consistently when I first met him. And he talked about this thing called territorial imperative. And he caught my attention when he started talking about that. And I didn't understand that. And he kind of broke it down and said to me that territorial imperative means that a person identifies with a land. And we were the only ones that did not identify with a land and why it's so important for us as humans to make our way at least once to that spot where we believe we came from, which is where we will come in touch with the energy that made us great. The Territorial Imperative, written by Robert Ardrey in 1966, discussed the similarities between humans and animals in regards to instinctual actions. These actions are necessary for man or animal to reach the height of their physical, mental, and creative potential. The territorial imperative is an absolute. It's an absolute necessity for man to relate positively to the land of his ancestry. This will give him three things. Give him stimulation, gives him security, and above all, gives him race esteem. Now, race esteem is the foundation for self-esteem. Without race esteem, you cannot have self-esteem. Race esteem is the flower, and self-esteem is the mere fragrance of that flower. Italians identify with Italy, Irish identify with Ireland, and so forth, but we didn't. So he kind of caught my attention from that uh, point on. All territorial creatures of which man is one have greater creativity, greater physical strength, greater brain power, if they are physically in the territory of their ancestors. Take the salmon, for instance. The salmon cannot procreate until it swims to and finds not only the river of its ancestors, nor the stream that branches off from the river, it must reach its exact hatching place in the stream before spawning the next generation. For mankind, territorial imperative means honoring the ancestral land of that race and honoring the ancestors of that land. For instance, the Jewish people, uh, their magnetic lines of force are in ancient Israel. And they relate to that. And they re the American Jewish people relate to ancient Israel, psychologically love that place. And because of that, they don't kill each other. Only 2% of America's population are Jewish. And yet they are 48% of the top billionaires of America. So not only do they relate in loving, lovingness to uh, ancient Israel, but they also love the ancestors, the ancient ancestors of ancient Israel. And those two things together give them this magnificent place in world finances, in America's finances, and they don't 
kill each other as we do. Young Edward began to see that this is the root cause of all the problems that affect the African-American community. There's a whole hatred thing against our physical appearance, our features, our hair, and so on. And all that's tied up with the territorial imperfection. Bottom of the problem is we are killing each other so many uh, minute more than any other race of people. What is the problem? It was a systematic programming to despise everything African about them. He believed fiercely in the proposition that black people have been blinded by hundreds of years of institutionalized miseducation and misportrayals of African people and African history in our educational institutions and in film, literature, and the news media. He was the first person to tell me about a paired associative learning. And I have used the same examples that he gave me with students ever since. By pairing our looks with degradation, with crime, lines of criminals, graffitied walls, torn down houses, other evidences of powerlessness and degradation, nobody wants to be powerless. So everybody rejects those looks which are paired with that powerlessness. On the other hand, if a certain type of looks with, with uh, uh, poorly pigmented skin and uh, unevolved hair and pinched features are always paired with beautiful surroundings, dressed in beautiful clothing, speaking beautiful language, solving great intellectual problems, doing great moral deeds, evidencing all of the facets of power then everybody wants to identify with power and want to identify by association with those looks. Just take color purple, for instance. Now, color purple is an excellent example of a subliminal impact. In color purple, they had various colorations of black men. They had some very richly pigmented and all the way down to the bottom of the color line, they had very poorly pigmented black men. Now, the very richly pigmented black men were the rapists of their own daughters. They were the ones who were very bestial and beat up young girls. Now, at the other end of the line, of the color line, the poorly pigmented boyfriend of Shu was uh, not only poorly pigmented, but he had uh, uh, straight hair. And therefore, they showed him being very positive, spoke very good English, and was very loving and very kind. So what, they, what it did, while you didn't notice it, and we tested this on hundreds of people who didn't even notice the difference in coloration, but the subconscious did. The subconscious and every person did because it reinforced the negativity of black. He believed the psychological damage caused by this miseducation and the omission of our cultural education results in low self-esteem, lack of self-confidence, self-hatred, and as Dr. Robinson called it, low race esteem. This whole image thing is so important. So the stuff that Doc was doing was trying to counteract those negative images by betraying all the positive and strong images of African Americans uh, in America. So the purpose of history is to help us reconnect the dots, help us to understand how we got where we are, the circumstances that shaped our present conditions are, are rooted in past acts that are still manifesting themselves today. According to Merriam-Webster, intrinsic means belonging to the essential nature or constitution of a thing. Extrinsic means not forming part of or belonging to a thing. Intrinsic is ancestral. It's another word for ancestral value. Extrinsic value is how good are you in whatever you do.
how good an actor, how good an athlete, and so on. In the social studies or history, a student can read along in a book for six chapters talking about the splendor and the grandeur of Europe, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes chapter 7 or chapter 8, and the heading is slavery. And from no place, no reference point to compare with, this becomes the starting point. So all of these images are subliminal impacts on our subconscious and makes us degrade the essence and humanity of the people against whom the subliminal impact is directed. But if you went back and put chapter 6 and chapter 5 and chapter 4 and chapter 3 and chapter 2 and chapter 1 and then chapter minus 1 and minus 2 and minus 3, you would eventually get back to the splendor and the grandeur of Kemet and the pyramids and all of the amazing discoveries if you want to stop young African Americans from killing each other, uh, teach them about their history, teach them about their struggle, teach them about uh, the fact that they, uh, that they are a part of civilization as we know it. Uh, so Dr. Robinson would be out there on his thumb teaching uh, and preaching and, and singing and uh, talking to people about what they need to do in order to, uh, in order to bring about a basic and fundamental change in the way things are happening in our society. We found that if we train children in the beauty, grandeur, and sophistication of our African, that is, Kemetan and Songhai ancestry, the children's mark shot up and their behavior became exemplary. I think our young people will be proud, be much more empowered, be much more uh, positive about themselves and about their lives when they understand the history of our people, or the history of all people, and its origins in Africa. His engagement with history was most inspired by the fact that there was so much misinformation about African history in our country, in our school curriculums and even in a historic city like Philadelphia. And that was his lens into understanding ourselves through the human events told in history. And that, that, was, that was the subject matter that most inspired him. Dr. Robinson began his lifelong mission to reprogram society. Dr. Robinson was finally able to get a few people to listen to his story and historical research that Tarzan was a myth. Had been told through Dave Richardson of, uh, about um, this uh, wonderful uh, relative of his who uh, had an extensive knowledge of uh, not only African-American history, but uh, uh, West African history. And so that was the uh, motivation. Uh, we, we began to build uh, what we call the Yamoja Free School around information that he provided uh, to us. Dave used to tell me about Dr. Robinson and his brother Calvin all the time. And then I was fortunate enough one day to be introduced to Dr. Robinson and we've shared um, a friendship and uh, a mutual respect for one another ever since that day, which has been quite some time ago. His mantra was the story he often told to illustrate the current state of consciousness of black people, the story about the eagle and the chicken. Something out there in the sky and it's calling me, and he looked up in the sky, and, and there a speck appeared, and the speck got larger and larger, became the largest bird he'd ever seen. Of course, you, know, you and I know it was a full-grown eagle, and the eagle spied a little turk down there on the ground and came in on a branch hanging over the barnyard and settled on the branch and looked down at him and said, what are you doing down there with those chickens? The story about the eagle who thought he was a chicken 
And that, I always remember that. And I think I took that story and used it for about 10 years. I never gave him credit for it, but I had a good time telling it. And I probably embellished it a lot of ways. But it was so uh, rich and so empowering uh, to have the message uh, that, you know, uh, black people needed to view themselves as eagles. The story said to the listener that you, the African American, were meant to soar to heights of achievement like the eagle inherent in the African pedigree as the first people, rather than to live in ignorance. So this was one of the key things that really caught the attention of the young people when he would say to them, you've got the strength of kings and queens in your wings. You don't have to accept a C average because it's in your blood so you can soar above everybody. They flew over a deep valley and the other eagle said, we'll fall into the valley, it's so deep we'll fall. He said, that's the valley of American hatred of blacks. He said, we'll fall. He said, you won't fall. You'll fly safely over that valley of hatred because you have the strength of kings in your wings. Fly on. And pretty soon they came to a desert. It was the desert of don't care, the desert of mediocrity, the desert of only a sea average. The young eagle said, we don't see any trees in sight on which to alight, to rest, yet you don't need rest. You will fly safely over this desert of don't care because you have the strength of kings in your wings. They don't know who they were, just like I didn't know. See, when I was running around looking for curly hair, I, I didn't know who I was. I was trying to you know, smooth down my hair like the eaglet, <laughs> you see, uh, and rubbing something on my skin to try to make it lighter. Uh, so if you, ha if you don't have that uh, album, please get it. The story of the eaglet is priceless. Strength of what? Kings in your wing. And you young people are those eagles. You will fly safely over the hatred. You will fly safely over the low marks in school. You will fly safely over American injustice because you are kings and queens. And I've got to say to a great extent that came from the empowering words of Ed Robinson who told us that we were eagles and we ought to, you know, get out of the chicken yard and start acting like eagles. And in the 1970s, a group of us got together and started doing that in politics. And of course, that led to Bill Gray becoming a congressman. Uh, Dave Richardson was already an independent state rep. And obviously, I know he had imparted all of this knowledge and information on Dave, because Dave used to quote everybody. Doc Woods, I could tell you, was a major force behind the scene with Dave, making sure Dave was making the right decisions and, and speaking out on issues that he knew was important to the community. Um, so that's that kind of behind the scene influence Doc had, not only Dave, but any young person Doc came involved with. The person who was involved with all of us in this was a guy named W. Wilson Good, who became managing director and then became a mayor. And there were a bunch of others. And now we've had two black mayors simply because uh, we learned from Ed uh, that we were really eagles. By this time, I had become general manager of DAS. And I was so um, influenced by Dr. Ed that one day I decided to do an African history program on the FM, which was unheard of. So <clears throat> I put together a, a number of folks, um, uh, Dr. Ed Robinson, um, and at the time I didn't know it, but he bought his wife. I had Malefi Asante, I had Mark Hyman, I had uh, <clears throat> Godfrey Satoli. And when it came to Dr. Ed, Dr. Ed got up and started uh, talking and lecturing. And you know, that voice kind of captivated you. And then uh, sometime, at some point during his presentation, all of a sudden his wife stood up and started singing Motherless Child. And uh, this perhaps was the most influential thing that I had done via the airwaves. Uh, in my whole tenure at DAS. Uh, I later decided that I needed to share more of him. 
So I put him on the air in a program called Elder Speak that he co-hosted with his brother Calvin. Dr. Robinson identified the problem as low self-esteem, lack of knowledge of self, and the principles and history of the way of living that their ancient African ancestors experienced. His ideology is to infuse the whole community with the history of their culture and the principles they lived by. But our young people need to know who they are and, why, and how they are connected and the, proud, and the proud heritage that they have. Uh, and he would say, be proud of who you are because you come from kings and queens from the motherland. So, so he would, he would uh, be saying that today, now more than ever. He set about the business of creating a framework of understanding the how, why, and wonder of it all, creating an infusion of curriculum and dramas to change the image and perception of his people. He authored what is known as African Genesis Science, I started in 1945, right after I came out the Army, to try to get the Philadelphia School District to have African history included in the textbooks that the children had and had read and were studying from. Then what happened was we, um, we created the Black People's Unity Movement. And in the Black People's Unity Movement, the whole idea was for us to do trainings. In other, the other words, you could not assume that all black people were on the same page. So the Black People's Unity Movement, our, our mission was to, to take those blacks who were willing to, men, women, young and old, and train them in a philosophy in terms of self-help, self-reliance, self-determination, and activism. Uh, Dr. Walter um, um, Lomax. Uh, Bubby Lomax became a part of that, he and his wife Beverly. Uh, through his participation in BPOM, Black People's Unity Movement, that I f later joined, where I learned about things that I had never thought about before as it related to Africa. And all the attributes that we considered negative became positive based on his teachings. He always reminds us is that for people that do not know their history, they doomed relating to their future. And Dr. Robinson would always stress the importance of knowing our past to help us move through our future. That's a constant reminder of me as an African-American elected official in the State House. On November 17, 1967, 5,000 children from the Black People's, Uni Black People's Unity Movement, which I created along with Walter Palmer and Maddie Humphrey, marched down to the school district. And because they marched down, the Philadelphia police were called out, and we were all beaten, including my nephew, including me. In 1970, Dr. Robinson co-authored a book, Journey of the Songhai People. Well, the first book he wrote, The Journey of the Songhai People, he wrote with the fellow Battles and with his brother Calvin. Calvin was typing it on a typewriter that missed a couple of keys, and he was doing the one-finger typing. That whole book of the Journey of the Songhai People that we did out of a loose leaf notebook we taught at the house. Talks about the strengths and, 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 and the glory kingdom that was built and, and the institutions that were established and stuff. So that's important. I mean, that gives us a reference. If you don't have a point of reference about the greatness of, of your people and what they did, even under oppression, then you would not understand how important it is to, leave, to move forward uh, in the communities. Uh, the Journey of the Songhai People is a remarkable work and it has inspired a lot of people and brought a lot of people to consciousness. And I think that's when he started doing the Black Rhapsody and bringing the songs out. My brother Ed had Black Rhapsody. And that just happened to come about with the lecture when he was at William Penn. Someone heard us at William Penn High School and said, uh, as a matter of fact, he was a a young man from the Annenberg School of Communications. And he said, that ought to be on record. And he said, do you have any tapes? And I had one. He took it back to the University of Pennsylvania, made the tape, and that's how Black Rhapsody was born. 
Black Rhapsody was recorded in 1970, and it became a very popular, popular record, Black Rhapsody. And he's talking to the young queens at William Penn High School. The CD of Black Rhapsody, considered the most outstanding historical CD in the country. It not only tells the history of the Songhai people, but it also gives the story of the songs that mothers and fathers gave to the world, over 6,000 songs, call them spirituals. Also, in this is the story of the eagle, who had been brainwashed that he was a chicken. And what became of that? It's a wonderful story. It is used by ministers all over the United States. And that's in this CD called Black Rhapsody. How do teachers and the students spell about with his voice and the story of our history? And matter of fact, being a bibliophile and a collector, I still have that copy of Ed's signed by him to me. Well, first of all, Doc's voice. I mean, just listening to his voice, like, whoa, whoa, what is this? You know, was this, um, you know, and the once again, the information that he was sharing, the information he was teaching was, was very important. I played that tape every opportunity that I got. And if I was on the air today, I'd play it again today. Together with his wife, Harriet, he put African Genesis to work. It took the form of an animated film for children, The Songhai Princess, a portrayal of the life of the young and beautiful princess Nzinga of West Africa. He also wrote several other scripts, The Land of the Star People, an animated film depicting the Dogon people of West Africa and their great knowledge of astronomy. But his greatest book, as far as I'm concerned, is No Man Can A Hinder Me. And that just brings him to life. All I have to do is look at the title of it, and I see a man who walked the walk, talked the talk, and he was chronologically aged at 94, but he was gifted to perfection. I became more aware of my self-esteem. It, it heightened me, and it helped me to pursue even more improvement in my job, in my marriage, as a parent, you know, he, he, just, he just set the bar so high. In the classroom, community education leaders began to see his vision and truth, and soon adopted his principles of learning and inspiration into their curriculum. The Universal African Dance and Drum Ensemble, headquartered in Camden, New Jersey, uses the African History Infusion model to develop, teach, and create pride in following and spreading the richness of traditional African cultural dance in motion. Pushing the culture, and that's where our African Dance and Drum Ensemble piece come in, is getting the young people all over this country to appreciate their heritage and their culture. You know, through Dr. Robinson's teachings and, you know, his whole theology of education, academics, you know, the whole nine yards of what he believed in, we're actually living that and teaching that and doing that. The Universal African Dance and Drum Ensemble! He wrote the Dessert Club's curriculum, which was infused and designed to enlighten youth about their great ancient African heritage while increasing their positive ethnic consciousness and self-esteem. We went to Dr. Robinson and he did it and we've been using it for the last 13 years and it has achieved tremendous results. They did beautifully in school and their behavior became textbook behavior so vital and so important to our children to know their history, not just know their history, but know their correct history, which is what Dr. Robinson is dedicated to telling them. Emotech, which is a charter school in the city of Philadelphia, this year will have more black males graduating high school than, than the females. Open in 1998, Christine Wiggins, its founder, openly talks about the influences of Dr. Robinson in the creation of Emotech Charter School. And I listened to his words of wisdom. That's what started me to go at Leeds Middle School when I was in the district. 
at Leeds School where we tried the African Genesis program. We had it tracked by the computers at the Department of Accesses and Accountability at the school district. So from that, and that was a very successful program, I realized that Leeds was a middle school. Where were our children going from the middle school? And that's what made me decide to go after doing my own high school. In 2004, Dr. Robinson was awarded a contract with the Philadelphia Public School District to infuse African studies within the current social studies, science, and mathematics curricula from kindergarten to eighth grade. We gotta take these books, the anglicized books, 500 pages, give me 17 of those books, nine history, and eight science and geography, and I will infuse in the pages and the chapters the relevant African history. He said, you got it. Sure. You got it. He sent me 17 books. It took me quite some time. I was in my youth then. I was about 88. <laughs> He has received numerous awards and citations, among which is the Martin Luther King Award of the Drum Major for Social Justice. He also received the Nation Builder Award, presented by the National Black Caucus of State Legislators, the NAACP, and the largest black-owned tax preparation company in America, Comprotax, headed by Dr. Jackie Mayfield. I feel he's one of those uh, ancestors that are illuminating right now, and he's waiting on us who were left here in the vineyard to continue to do his work. And in 2007, Dr. Robinson received from his alma mater, Virginia State University, an honorary doctorate degree. But the ultimate thing that we have to accomplish are motion pictures. In this way, we will be able to reach millions instead of the few hundred thousand that we can in the school district. Dr. Robinson was working on what has been called the African Genesis Movies Project. He firmly believed that the solution to the problem was the creation of a flood of TV and motion pictures dramatically portraying the beauty, grandeur, and sophistication of West Africa. And he was dedicated and committed to producing, writing, showing, distributing dramatic films that would incorporate these elements so as to bring about a major transformation of our consciousness in a relatively short period of time to respond to the trauma, the stress, the downward spiral of our people. So Dr. Ed Robinson talking about audio and video as a way to move this thing forward is a stroke of genius. Everybody loves the adventures, the adventure story full of action, like Braveheart, like Lord of the Rings. Everybody that was love story was all composed and comprised within Whispers of the Medallion. It could be another route. It could have that type of impact of, of folk finally visualizing what it is to have a, a great Africa with kings and queens and folk, all right, who, who, who are inventing things and and doing things that we take for granted right now. So it is extremely important. That's his whole life. He's done a lot of study, a lot of research. It's ready to go. Dr. Robinson created five screenplays with the knowledge that he might never get to see them on the silver screen in his lifetime. In fact, he penned the script Return of the Pharaoh shortly before his death. These stories attempt to identify the social ills which have plagued the African-American community and teach the audience a moral which can be used in dealings with members of their own cultural community and the larger, more diverse community as a whole. You don't even know that emotionally you are changed. So Dr. Robinson gave us a lot. The value of it will be determined by what we do with it. If we do nothing with it, then of course he's left us nothing. And just talking to our young people today, I think he would really put an emphasis on them knowing their history. And hopefully that would help them build pride, good self-image, and the I want to achieve um, attitude. My position is that he is absolutely, and he was absolutely, and he is absolutely right 
He was right then, it's right today, it's what ought to be done, and we ought to be out there uh, supporting this movement to begin to have a Afrocentric curriculum in the school system of Philadelphia. A man who was selfless in his quest to debunk long-standing myths that have produced a legacy of self-hatred. The story of a man who never stopped carrying the message of hope and optimism to the multitude. A good teacher is somebody who pushes us without intimidating. So I miss that because I could use a little push. Ed Robinson really led the way uh, and uh, really uh, was the, the quintessential historian of our time. When you talk about his legacy, I think that his legacy will be that we have inherited the desire to follow through the solution. Long live the glory of Ed Robinson.